This video is sponsored by World of Warships. You know what's the absolute worst? Watching movies. You expect me to just sit there for two hours and look at something without doing anything? How am I supposed to enjoy something if I can't even smell Adam Sandler's farts? In an attempt to make the movie going experience more enticing, and of course to sell more tickets, there have been many efforts at introducing one-time gimmicks for select movies throughout the years. And I don't mean stuff like IMAX, which is more a type of cinema, which I actually learned recently I've never experienced because they don't have any where I live, and all I hear from Americans all the time is how great they are, so thanks guys. That being said, I am going to be very liberal with my use of the word gimmick throughout this video, so just keep that in mind. But before we move on, for this video I've collaborated with World of Warships to tell you all about their brand new Transformers event that really makes you wonder what broadside did to Optimus. World of Warships is a free-to-play team-based game for PC with more than 400 warships, 44 million players, and five different ship classes at your disposal. The game's teamed up with Transformers before, but obviously Prime and Megs didn't have enough of blowing each other up, because now Optimus and Bumblebee are joined by Grimlock and Hot Rod. Out of the way, hot rod! While Decepticons, Megatron, and Rumble have now recruited Soundwave after remembering that none of his other cassettes can swim. Oh, and Starscream's there too if you've ever wanted to live out your dreams of being Galvatron. And of course, I've got a promo code for you all. Pick a side and use either Autobots or Decepticons 2021 during registration to unlock 1 million credits, Grimlock or Soundwave to command your ships and cause immeasurable amounts of property damage, a specific tier 5 premium ship for either side with names I can't pronounce, as well as 20 ship camos to deck out your boats. This is a limited time only event though, ending on October 21st, so if you want to get on blowing up Starscream and don't want to miss the boat, then be sure to check out the description for the links and codes you need. And now back to the video. Many things that I think would have originally been considered gimmicks have now become a widespread part of the film industry. Like Toy Story being an entirely computer generated film, paving the way for that to be the only type of animated movie Hollywood would make for the rest of time. Thanks Pixar! Or even The Wizard of Oz being the very first movie to be filmed in Technicolor, which I'm sure is never gonna catch on. The very first one that obviously comes to mind is 3D. A gimmick that kind of always comes and goes in Hollywood. And even though it's been absent for a while as of right now, it always finds a way to come back. 3D movies reached their peak in popularity, I'd say around the mid 2000s, with such bangers as The Adventures of Sharkboy and Lava Girl, of course. And while I'm sure getting to see naked blue alien people on the big screen was very enticing to people, the mere thought of seeing them in 3D was clearly what helped Avatar make like 15 bajillion dollars. 3D movies date back as far as 1922, apparently, the same time when most of the people who vote on the Academy Awards were born, beginning with the movie The Power of Love, which unfortunately has since been lost to time. Luckily, they released a 2D version shortly after, which has also gone missing. God damn it, guys. The problem with these, though, is that movies that are specifically designed with 3D in mind can make for a pretty lackluster viewing experience when watched without it, since you have to sit through so many scenes of things flying toward the camera. I mean, have you ever tried to watch Spy Kids 3D without glasses? I do not recommend it. Personally, I've never really been big on 3D in any kind of form. I was always one of those kids who got really annoyed having to wear these uncomfortable paper glasses for like an hour and a half. Yeah, I know. Like, the 3DS never really did anything for me. It was just kind of one of those things that's a little fun once and then you just forget about it and revert back to doing it normally. Come on, be honest, how many times did you actually use that slider? I've never really gotten the appeal of it, to be honest. I feel like the gimmick of having things be slightly closer to my face wore off after like the first time. And of the very few 3D movies I've seen, I just don't think I've ever seen a practical use for them. She's real. She's finally real. With that being said, I haven't actually experienced a 3D movie since I was like... 11. And I was very keen to refresh my memory for this video, but cinemas just aren't showing them at the moment. And I never thought that would be a problem for me, but here we are. Of course, the natural step from there was 4D, which introduces even more interactivity like vibrating chairs and fans, though these tend to be less widespread since you need a specially designed cinema for them to work. Aside from in theme parks, you mostly find these at carnivals or in arcades where they'll just make up some kind of dimension to make it sound impressive. You are now entering 7D. I remember being taken to see Spy Kids 4D in cinemas once. God, I owe my grandparents an apology. And you were given these scratch and sniff cards called Aromascope, where it told you at certain points in the movie to use in order to smell what was happening on screen. And because this is a Spy Kids movie we're talking about, I can't say I'm surprised to find out that three out of eight of them were poop and snot related. There was this 4D Shrek film I got to see at Universal Studios once where like, you actually got to feel Shrek snot covering your face. It was just a great experience. In order to talk about movie gimmicks when they were at their most abundantly popular, we're gonna have to go back a bit. Generally, gimmicks from back in the day were more concerned with how they could involve an audience in the movie, and there are just 
So many attempts at this. The movie The Horrors of the Black Museum had Hypno Vista, where they played a short segment of a hypnotist attempting to entrust the audience before the movie started to try and make them more afraid. Whether or not this actually worked is debatable, but it definitely did from a financial perspective. Terror in the Haunted House had Psychorama, which involved them flashing scary JPEGs during the movie to try and make audiences uneasy. I look up that narrow, dusty stairway. Earthquake implemented in cinemas what they called Sense Around, which supposedly let audiences experience what felt like an actual earthquake, and it's it's really nice to listen to, only for them to immediately retire it because it kept damaging theaters. Homicidal interrupted itself near the end to give the audience a fright break, where they were given the option to walk out and get a refund if they were too scared to keep watching, which I'm sure sounded like a great idea on paper until everyone started getting refunds. Their solution was to add an extra condition to this deal, where people who wanted the refund had to stand in what they called the coward's corner. Which, okay, is pretty funny. The 1973 movie Wicked Wicked, Wicked introduced Duo Vision, which was basically a form of split screen where one section showed the victim's perspective and the other the killer, just in case understanding a movie's plot is not your thing. My personal favorite out of all the ones I read is The House on the Haunted Hill, that had a special pulley system built into every cinema where it screened so that a skeleton would pop out at random moments so he could. <laughs> Look at him go! The strange marketing gimmicks that have been used to advertise movies throughout history are an entirely different topic I don't want to get into because we'll be here forever, but I did want to mention the movie Macabre that promised a thousand dollar insurance policy for anyone that died of fright while watching it. And as hilarious as this sounds, they actually specify that it didn't apply to anyone with any pre-existing medical conditions or anyone that committed suicide just in case it actually happened. What am I supposed to do with this now? Hitchcock Psycho boasted a no late admissions policy where they wouldn't let anyone to the cinema after the movie had started because I learned while reading about these that apparently walking into a cinema halfway through a movie was quite common back then. What kind of sick monster? And now back to today. Oh God, the color. Nowadays I'd say gimmicks are a lot more about making a movie stand out and offering a unique standalone experience. And sadly they, they just don't give them stupid names anymore. Gemini Man was filmed at a higher frame rate so it could be presented at select cinemas at 120 frames per second, which reportedly was actually pretty cool. Whereas I just got to watch it on Netflix at a normal frame rate like a commoner. The 2015 movie Hardcore Henry is filmed entirely in first person and <laughs> to make it <clears throat> to make it look more like a video game. <clears throat> it's honestly pretty impressive. <laughs> How they were able to- <laughs> I've talked about these next two before, but may as well mention them anyway. Unfriended, which I'm sure we're all quite familiar with on this channel, <gasps> takes place entirely on a Skype call, where it was filmed with each actor recording on a computer in separate rooms. And in 2020, during the COVID pandemic, when no one was allowed to go outside, thank God we're all done with that now, right? <laughs> <laughs> the movie Host was filmed and coordinated entirely through a Zoom call where each actor was responsible for their own makeup, lighting, and stunts. Yeah, what did you do during lockdown, huh? Films like 1917 and Birdman are edited to give the illusion of being one long take. Since, y you know, coordinating and filming for an hour and a half straight would be near impossible, I would know. <laughs> Except for Time Code from 2000, which decided to take both this and the Duo Vision idea from the 70s and do it on steroids, with four continuous takes all playing at the same time following different characters and subplots that would intersect at select moments. And this movie is nuts because all at once you get these guys during a board meeting and a girl going for a walk along the street and then these two going at it in the quarter. With gimmicks sort of phasing themselves out of cinemas for the most part, it's been left to streaming services to try out their own experiments. Netflix has been trying their hand with interactive movies, with ones where you can destroy Bear Grylls' intestines and drop them down a waterfall, or just straight up play Minecraft story mode. But their most notable one of course was Black Mirror's Bandersnatch, a unique and ambitious way of seeing how badly an audience is able to fuck up someone's life with as few decisions as possible. Periodically throughout, prompts appear on screen waiting for you to choose what happens next, which transition incredibly smoothly into the next scene. Although I do find it very funny how with the first choice they have to preemptively remind you to pick up your remote, as if this concept of pressing a button is too difficult for anyone to understand. While Bandersnatch is far from the first interactive movie, it's probably the only one that lets you fight your therapist to the death. So it has that going for it. It's a really cool idea made even more impressive by the way they had characters occasionally acknowledge when you were repeating a choice, but honestly I did come away from it feeling like something was missing. In spite of being one of those idiots who felt like they had to see every single possible choice before I could turn it off, even afterwards something about it just felt incomplete when compared to a normal movie. Yes I am very pretentious, how could you tell? Interactive films were being made as far back as the 60s, with the horror film Mr. Sardonicus asking audiences to vote for the fate of the villain at the end. But this was actually all bullshit 
shit because the vote was rigged and he just dies anyway, and they never actually made a good ending. Clue from 1985 had three alternate endings that changed the identity of the killer issued to different theaters, meaning you might have had to rewatch the movie several times in order to get the proper one. But there was no way of knowing what one you were going to see, so you would have had to sit through the entire thing again only to get the same one. It'd be like buying a Happy Meal over and over just to get a different toy, which I've definitely never done. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, for the dumbest one of all, there's the yet-to-be-released movie 100 Years by Spy Kids director Robert Rodriguez. And boy, can you tell, that is set to release in the year 2115, where it'll be competing with the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. The reason for its absurd release date is to match the time required to properly age a single bottle of some beer or something that's sponsored by. Nothing aside from that is known about it so far, and we're going to have to wait a very, very long time to find out more. So in the end, give Gimmicks can be fun, and they definitely provide a memorable viewing experience, even if they're very stupid. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'll excuse me...